everyone, and welcome to DevNexus. Thanks for coming to this session on RSocket and Spring, a full throttle introduction. My name is Mark Heckler. I'm a Spring developer and advocate with VMware. You can reach me at marketheheckler.com or mheckler at vmware.com if you have any questions, comments, or feedback after the fact. But the level best way to reach me is on Twitter at mkheck. So please do reach out to me there. Hope to see you there. So a little bit about me. I am an author. I've co-authored a couple of books. I contributed content and code to several other books. I even have a new book in the pipeline. Well, actually, it's not in the pipeline anymore. It's out. I am an architect and developer by trade. And as you might surmise from the next couple of points of where most of my expertise has been won, it's been in the JVM ecosystem. Uh, I am a Java champion, a Java One Rockstar, Groundbreaker Ambassador, a Google Developer Expert in Kotlin, and several other honors and awards that, while I truly appreciate, means I still have to buy my own coffee. I don't know who I need to see about that, but here we are, so <laughs> that's fine. I am also the sole creator and curator of Spring Noticias en Español. A couple of years ago, I thought, uh, you know, I, I speak Spanish even worse than I speak English, so, you know, thanks for your patience uh, today and any other day, I guess. But I thought, you know, it seems a shame there's no central place that we can go to kind of get the word out, to share resources better. And I thought it was just a small thing that I could do to maybe help the Spanish-speaking community, the Spanish-speaking Spring community, depending on who you listen to, what stats you read. Spanish is either the second or the fourth most spoken language in the world, and it seemed a shame that we weren't able to better uh, aggregate and share those resources. So if you have Spanish language resources, if you produce them, please let me know and I'll be happy to help amplify your voice. If not, that's fine too. I am also a licensed pilot and that's another one of my huge interests, right? Uh, it's amazing the amount of trust that a national government will extend to you if you pass multiple exams, written, oral, check rides, flying tests and things of that nature. It's a lot of fun. Anyway, let's go on. So I do have a new book out. It's now available. I've been saying for the last several months, gosh, it's going to be available. It's early release, early access. It is in the wild. So this is a pectoral sandpiper uh, that you see here. And the piper and I, we finally shipped, right? So if you're interested in knowing more, check out the link here and that will take you directly to the O'Reilly site. And by all means, uh, check it out. I'm happy to be able to share that with the world finally. So our journey kind of begins with reactive streams. And if you've done a lot of imperative, that's a little bit of a misnomer, but we'll go with that because it's probably the best descriptor that I can think of at this point in time. But if you've done typical spring MVC development, you've probably used a lot of your standard types, right? You know, so if you're returning something from a method, for example, uh, you're returning an object of type T, or perhaps if you need to return multiple objects of type T, you might return some kind of an iterable, a collection, a list, what have you. So you have the imperative types, if you will. So let's say you have a collection of things that you're sending back. You wait until that entire collection is assembled and then you send it back in mass which is fine. And in many cases that works perfectly well. However, there are many other cases where that doesn't because you may have an indeterminate number of values that you're trying to pass back. And some of those in some circumstances may come in and trickle in or they may come in steadily, but they never really stop, right? So you have an indefinite number of values or objects over an indeterminate amount of time. And this poses special problems when you're waiting to collect everything before you send anything. And thus the Reactive Streams initiative was born. And I'm grossly oversimplifying, but that certainly does address that particular use case or those particular use cases exceedingly well. Because the problem with the prior approach uh, when it comes to dealing with large numbers or sporadic values is that you have issues with scaling. You also have the issue if you have a connection that you're waiting for everything to come back, that connection is blocked. <laughs> We're gonna be talking about blocking and non-blocking uh, interactions here quite a bit. But you have a certain number of connections that can be maintained in the typical imperative model because those are blocked. If you have a client application that's dealing with a backend or a server type of application and they're connected and interacting, right? That's a connection. And typically within the Java realm, you have a connection per thread. So what happens is that you have a certain specified number of connections that can be maintained before everything kind of stops. And that works really well for a small number of connections, right? A small number of requests but it doesn't work for that N plus one request, uh, at least not nearly as well, because at some point blocking occurs and, and a large wait can potentially occur. With reactive streams, everybody who, who participated in developing the whole reactive streams initiative and the components within the reactive streams initiative addressed the interactions. 
So the React to Streams initiative was built primarily or developed primarily to focus on those interactions and to increase the scalability of the system of systems, those multiple application systems. So you have, as part of the React to Streams initiative, you have the specification, which is kind of, here are the goals we want to accomplish, here is kind of how we set out to do it. The API specifically defines well, the API, the application programming interface, right? Which I'll get into momentarily, but it's a very streamlined, simple API because it was meant to define certain ground rules, but not specific implementations. You have examples of how to implement that API so that if you do decide to go ahead and create an implementation, you have something to go from. And a TCK, arguably, in my mind, certainly one of the most important aspects because a technology compatibility kit, a TCK, allows you, if you are developing an implementation of the API, the Reactive Streams API, you can validate your implementation, you can verify how compliant you are. Are you 80% compliant, 90% compliant? Where are the things that you need to work on in order to hit that 100% compliant level? And there are numerous parties to the Reactive Streams initiative. You had key players like Twitter and Kazing and Netflix and Pivotal at the time, now VMware, who came together to say, look, we want to accomplish certain things. We want that interoperability between uh, different implementations. And how are we going to accomplish that? And the way to accomplish that is to define a very streamlined API because everybody has different ideas on how to implement that right? But as long as they're validated with the TCK, we know that those will be interoperable, which gets end developers out of the integration game, fighting and struggling between different competing implementations. There's no reason to be in that game because if they're valid and validated against the, the TCK, we know that they work together. So within the Reactive Streams API, there are four interfaces defined and they are truly, they are interfaces, right? So you have to provide a, a, an implementation or use a provided implementation from some provider. Very quickly, you have a publisher, which is just the thing that produces things, right? A subscriber is the thing that consumes those things. A subscription is the contract entered into between subscriber and publisher. And then you have a processor, which incorporates both subscriber and publisher, because a processor will subscribe to and receive items from a feed and then manipulate them in some way and then pass them on to its subscribers. So again, it's a very simple API definition. It's a very simple set of interfaces that can be implemented as you see fit within the model that you have in mind. I would argue, and there are numerous implementations of the Reactive Streams API, but I would argue that Project Reactor is quite possibly the best. Now I'm biased, I'll admit that, but you find that Project Reactor forms the foundation of many commercial and open source projects out there that are being used to great effect. And one of those, by the way, is RSocket. And RSocket, um, I guess I should momentarily tell a little bit more, and let me back up just a moment. The Reactive Streams API is an asynchronous, non-blocking API with back pressure. And sometimes when folks see the Reactive Streams API and the and understand the concept of Reactive Streams, they think, well, that's that's just asynchronous processing, right? No, it isn't. It has asynchronicity as a typical core implementation detail, right? But it isn't just asynchronous processing because with asynchronous processing in and of itself, there's nothing that would stop a large number of values coming back at a very rapid pace from a supplier of those values, a publisher on the other end. Oh, well, I shouldn't mix terms, but a provider of those values to a very slow moving, ill-equipped consumer of those values. So an asynchronous API, you could have service one pinging service two saying, give me all of your data. Service two gladly complies and, and obliges and sends a million records of something, right? And service one can't keep up with that. But since it requested that however many number of values you have, and even though they're being processed and responded by service two asynchronously, that sheer number of values, that sheer volume is going to collapse and crush service one. Now with a reactive streams implementation, what happens is you have back pressure. It adds in back pressure and your service one can say, look, I'm a slow service over a slow connection. Just give me 10 values. All right, there may be a million values, but give me 10 and I will process those. And then I'll request 10 more or 50 or 500 or whatever that magic number is. But with back pressure, it keeps that slower or more, um, I don't want to say brittle, uh, but maybe it's over a, a sketchy connection and it keeps the ability of the slower or, or more detached consumer of those values. Uh, it keeps them in the game. 
right? So it keeps them able to process a small number and then request more instead of just hoping for the best and requesting whatever might be coming down the pipeline. So uh, that's a lot of value. However, when you're crossing that network boundary, right? Uh, and you're doing it over typical transports uh, like HTTP, HTTP has a very request response oriented set of interactions, right? So you are somewhat limited in terms of the interactions that you can provide or fully support using something like reactive streams. However, RSocket addresses that. So RSocket builds upon reactive streams, the project reactor implementation of reactive streams, and it's based on whatever transports underneath that can be supported in a way that allows RSocket to provide multiple interaction models. And of course, one of those is the typical request response. Yeah, it's very similar and very, I guess, common. It's a common use case that our socket fully supports. You might also have a request stream. So issue a single request from service one and service two says, hey, look, I've got 10 or 500 values to send back. I'll send them back to you. Fire and forget. Service one says, hey, look, here's a value, take it. And I'm expecting nothing in return. And then a bi-directional channel, which allows both services in this case, we were talking service one, service two, to initiate communication. Now, I want to back up and say that initially uh, you have of those two services, you have one that serves as a server and one that serves as a client. So one, the client application will initiate the connection. But once that connection is established, they're effectively peers. And that means that either can initiate the next conversation, if you will, or the next monologue in case of the fire and forget. So it allows you the ultimate inflexibility. It also establishes the, the capability for back pressure. As I mentioned, you can base an RSocket set of interactions, an RSocket connection over different transports. So you have TCP, WebSocket, Iran, and it gives you a lot of, of extras too, like resumption. So if you drop a connection from a mobile device, for instance, that mobile device can reconnect. So if it goes from a Wi-Fi connection to a cellular connection, then you can pick up where you left off. So it gives you a lot of power and flexibility based on Project Reactor, which is based on reactive streams. Kind of nice. Okay, let's code, right? So uh, yeah, this is not me. I, I know it says it's me, but this is really Maurice Moss. And if for those of you who don't know, this is from the IT crowd. It's an older uh, series, but if you haven't seen it, highly, highly recommended. So with that, let's dive into some code. Now I'm going to start here at the Spring Initializer, and we're just going to create a couple of uh, Spring Boot projects. I'm going to keep things pretty vanilla and simple because I want to focus on specific things, not on window dressing. Uh, so I'm going to make this a Maven project using Java. Now, you do have options. Uh, if you're a uh, Maven developer, if you like, if you prefer Maven as your build system, you can use Maven. Uh, if you're a hipster, you can use, use Gradle. It's fine. Um, <laughs> I also use Kotlin and Groovy from time to time, but we're going to stick again with Maven and Java today. Current version of Spring Boot, which is 2.4.2. So that's all good. I'm going to go ahead and change my group name to com.theHecklers because I can. Uh, and I'm just going to call these two services thing one and thing two. All right. Um, so let's see. Uh, we're going to create a jar uh, and we're going to use Java 11. So let's go ahead and add some dependencies here. Uh, I'm going to, again, keep it pretty simple. So I'm going to bring in Spring Reactive Web Dependency, which allows us to build reactive web apps. Uh, I'm going to use Lombok because I'm a lazy developer. Uh, lazy good, not lazy bad. I just want to be very clear about that. Uh, but that allows us to reduce the boilerplate code. And I'm going to, again, focus on the important things here today and not just writing pages and pages of boilerplate. Uh, and then, uh, of course, RSocket, because RSocket is, is kind of important if we're going to be talking about RSocket. So I'm going to generate the project, I'm just going to drop thing one out on the desk. And then just to uh, keep things tight on uh, time here, I'm going to go ahead and generate thing two. Any Dr. Seuss fans out there? Well, why not, right? Okay, so let me move this over so we can see that. There we go. I have a look around my microphone to make sure I, uh, you know, hit the right keys here, at least from time to time. Okay, so I'm going to open that up. Oh, I do want to show you uh, because uh, let me go ahead and I guess configure this uh, now. So I'll go ahead and open the application properties and the app. Um, but what I want to do is close that, close that. And I do want to show you what I'm going to be using for my domain because again, I'm a pilot, right? And I love to keep track of things, you know, various aviation uh, based things. And I have a device here. It's back behind me on the desk. It's a small device and it, it works with a site called planefinder.net. 
and it allows you to feed data from aircraft that are flying over your area. And I just have a small device with a small antenna here sitting out by the window. Uh, so I don't, you know, the range isn't very great, but, you know, I do pull in a few from time to time. Jets flying overhead to the local international airport, small planes flying over for training, whatever, uh, UPS, FedEx. And it's kind of cool because I get a lot of information, things like the call sign, the, the transponder code, the squawk code, if you will, the registration number, the flight number, the route that it's taking, what type of aircraft, what category, and then things like the altitude, the heading, the airspeed, the vertical rate, that's the, the rate of climb or descent, the selected altitude, what that's the target altitude. So you may have a current altitude of 3,000 feet, but your target altitude is 39,000 feet. So you get a lot of information, or at least potentially, you know, not all you know, records are provided with full details, but you can potentially get quite a bit of cool information. So I'm going to be using that because I find that, you know, real data is cool data, right? It's, it's nice to generate the data, but it's really nice to actually have real life data because it's just, I don't know, it's just much more fun, right? Okay, now I actually am going to go back and open my Thing 2 project. So I can go ahead and start it up as well. Perfect, look at that. Okay, so I'm going to open up my application.properties and the application. And there we go, okay. So go ahead and move around, close that, close that. And there we go, okay. So you can certainly use our socket and reactive streams outside of Spring Boot applications, but this is just the easiest way to do all of the above. And uh, here's kind of evidence of that because with Spring Boot, you have auto configuration and auto configuration allows you to kind of get that running start. The Spring team is really good at finding patterns, seeing patterns. And, and when you're a developer, I mean, you see them too initially, in most cases, you if you repeat something two, three, five times, it becomes repetitive. You see that and you think, wow, there should be a way to automate this away and take care of this. But if you see it all the time, you kind of become numb to it. But what we look for within the spring team is just ways to take actions that happen over and over the same way, the same time over and over and make that part of the auto configuration. Because if you do the same thing over and over the same way, there's no reason you have to, should have to write pages and pages of code to do that. So I'm going to, uh, I'm going to set a couple of properties here, server port, in this case, I'm gonna make this port 9090, and then I'm going to set the RSocket server port to 9091. Now, just setting this port number and having RSocket on the class path is enough for my application to know that it should be an RSocket server. You can see that this is a pretty strong hint right here. <laughs> So there's no magic to it. Uh, there's a lot of good technology behind it, but there's certainly no magic to it. But let's go ahead and create our RSocket server. We're gonna be interacting between our applications using RSocket uh, and not just HTTP-based calls, but we will use an HTTP-based call to actually go out to Plane Finder and pull that data in. But let's go ahead and start here. I'm going to create my domain class. We're gonna call this aircraft, and we're going to skinny this down. We don't necessarily need all the data that's provided by the plane finder device and that's provided from each aircraft as it flies overhead. But we are going to want a few uh, key things, right? So we'll want our call sign, uh, call psi, psi. Uh, we'll want our registration number, we'll want a flight number and we'll want the aircraft type. We also will probably want things like our altitude because that's cool information to know, the heading and the airspeed. And then of course we'll want our uh, oops, let's see, we want a uh, lat and lawn, so we get a position. I'm going to, again, I'm using Lombox, I'm gonna use at data, so this makes this a data class. A Lombok will create my getter setters equals hash code and two string methods. Uh, and then I'm going to set this to ignore unknown properties because I've got a lot of properties potentially that could be coming in. And I only want these, right, for our demo here today, so that's, that's fine. All right, so I'm going to create a controller so this will be our thing to controller, controller. And we're going to define some endpoints here. So we'll do a message mapping and we're going to start off with a request, uh, let's see, request response. Now this is one of the four interaction models that I mentioned that our socket has, a request response, right? Now, let's see, so we're going to, we're gonna expect a response. So we're going to return a mono of aircraft. Now. What's a mono, you might ask? Well, if you remember, I mentioned that the Reactive Streams specification defines a publisher, a subscriber, a subscription, and a processor. 
And the publisher is something that produces values. And that could be zero values. It could be one value. It could be numerous values. Within Project Reactor, we felt it made sense to distinguish between something that might provide a value from something that might provide a lot of values. And that's just like standard imperative Java, right? If you have a, a return value, you might return an aircraft or you might return an iterable of aircraft, right? But, you know, this kind of makes sense. I mean, and we, this is something we do all the time every day without thinking of it. So what we're going to do is the same thing here. Within Project Reactor, we define a mono of aircraft, which means zero or one values, one at most. Or you have a flux, which is a publisher that can return a lot of values, maybe a small collection, maybe five or eight or 20. Or maybe it's, again, that indeterminate number of values over an indeterminate amount of time. So you may have a value per second until the end of the world. <laughs> so that allows you to distinguish. And there are operations that apply equally well to both, but there are operations that really only apply to a value or a maybe the other way around to a number of values. So that allows us to distinguish very effectively and mirrors very much what we're all used to using in standard blocking Java code. So we're gonna return a mono of aircraft. We'll call this request response. Now we can accept nothing, but what I'm going to do is just expect a mono of type instance. So we get a timestamp, if you will. So we'll call this TS mono and what do we want to do with this? So I'm going to return and we'll take our, our TS mono and we'll do on next. So we grab our timestamp and I'm just going to, uh, just so we can see what's happening here, I'm going to print that out. I'm going to put a little clock in here. I think that's kind of nice. So that way it gets a little busy in the logs. So that way we can see in our demo kind of what's coming back. Now, I don't necessarily think you should probably put emojis in your normal production logs, but it works really well in this case. <laughs> so I'm going to then, let's see, we'll, we'll do a then, actually I said then and it works, uh, because I'm going to want to return a value, a mono of type aircraft as we see here. But where do we get that information? Well, I'm going to get that information by not doing that, by polling my plane finder service. As I showed you earlier, I have a service running that's going to provide a current flux of all aircraft that are flying currently over me in the general vicinity. So I want to uh, use a web client and this is a reactive web client from Spring. And that allows us to interact with reactive endpoints, reactive streams endpoints, publishers, or non-reactive endpoints, endpoints that will provide a standard object of type T or, or iterable of objects of type T. So in this case, we're going to be uh, creating a web client and we'll point this to HTTP colon slash slash localhost where I have the service running 7634 and the aircraft endpoint, aircraft. Very nice. Okay, so then we'll just use that client and we'll get our, our aircraft, right? We'll convert the body to a flux and because we're gonna be getting back zero to N. We don't really know how many uh, and then I'm going to just uh, grab the next one. So we'll grab one and that returns a mono and that gets us started, right? So I'm gonna go ahead and run that and then we'll skip over and create our thing two. So thing two, uh, I don't need to add any properties at this point, but what I am gonna do is just uh, quickly whip up some code. So once again, our class is aircraft and let's see. So we have a uh, private string call string 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 call sign uh, reg flight no and type private uh, this is these are ints so altitude heading and speed and uh, double for lat and lawn and then of course uh, once again at data all right so and let's see so we also uh, at this point we need to define a component i'll just keep this pretty simple so this will be our um, thing to component. And uh, let's see, so yeah, let's just do a post, oops, not that, post construct, and we'll do a private void uh, request, request, response. Now let's uh, let's run this. So I, I do need to have an RSocket requester, which is rather handy. I'm gonna create a bean here, which will uh, provide an RSocket requester and by having the RSocket dependency on my class path, what I actually have is Spring Boot will 
will create a builder via auto config. So I'm gonna use that builder to, yeah, define a TCP connection pointing to localhost, localhost, and the port in this case is 9091. As you may recall, go over there and I go back to my properties, we see that the RSocket server port is 9091. So that's exactly where we need to be. And there we go, click back. All right, so I'm going to inject that now. So we'll inject our our socket requester here. And I'll do that using Lombok again, lazy developer. So I'm going to ask Lombok to provide a constructor for me with a parameter for each member variable. We have one, therefore we are now injecting our requester, our socket requester. So I'll use that requester, I'll provide the route. So let's go ahead and define our route, our rec response, which is the same thing we have over here. And we don't have to send any data, but I like to send data because that way we can, again, see what we're getting. So I'm gonna send a timestamp, an instant. Here's the current time, which we're expecting on the other end. And then I'm going to uh, retrieve a mono in this case, a single value is coming back in aircraft. And then with reactive streams, with publishers, nothing really happens until someone subscribes, a, a subscriber subscribes. Not necessarily always a case because there are hot publishers, but generally speaking, you should consider a publisher a cold publisher unless told otherwise. And that's very important because part of the way that reactive streams applications scale is because that they can do a lot of work. And they, of course, there's an event loop that handles a crazy number of connections. They can handle a lot of work, but if there are no subscribers, no work is actually done. And that's important because if you're trying to go back and retrieve thousands or hundreds of thousands or millions of records and no one's listening, why are you doing all that? You're wasting resources. So when it comes down to reactive publishers, typically we think of them as cold publishers. Once a subscriber subscribes, then the activity happens, then the, the action is kicked off. So that's exactly what we're going to do. We're going to subscribe. Uh, we're going to get back our aircraft. So let's print this out. And I'm just going to add in a little aircraft, airplane item, airplane, if I can type and AC, there we go. Okay, so let's run this and see what we get. So we have our thing two up and running, ready and waiting for a connection. And then we have our thing one, which is making that request, making the connection and request. So we see here that we've got, let me see if I can zoom this in. We see that our timestamp came in to thing two that we sent from our thing one. And then we got back an aircraft, in this case, from thing two to thing one. So everything's working fine. A single request, a single response. That's great. Let's go ahead and, and expand that to the second interaction model that our socket supports, which is, for those of you following along at home, request stream, right? And let's define this message mapping as request stream. And we'll return a stream, a flux, a flux of stream, yes, a flux of aircraft. Import, there we go. And this will be request stream. And we're expecting, uh, let's go ahead and send the same instant. Uh, and this will be our TS mono once again. Uh, return, actually, you know what? Uh, just in the interest of time, I'm going to go ahead and copy this. Fortunately, this is not being recorded, right? Oops. <laughs> okay, so the one thing that I do want to do is since we don't need to just grab one value, I'm going to remove that next and just return the flux. The other thing that I need to do, because we're not just using then, which of course expects a mono, provides a mono, we're going to use a then many, which expects a publisher and returns specifically a flux. So zero to n value. So this is exactly what we're going to do right here. So we have that in place. I'll go ahead and restart that. We'll go over to our thing two, or excuse me, thing one. And let's go ahead and comment that out. And let's go ahead and create our test method here. So private void request stream. And here we go, requester.route. And in this case, request stream. And we'll send data once again of a current timestamp instant. And we'll retrieve a flux in this case, once again, of aircraft class. And then let's subscribe once again, same thing, same rules apply, right? And we want to uh, grab our airplane. And actually I'm going to, in this case, be getting multiple airplanes, right? So we'll just put a couple there. So AC, and there we go. So let's run that. So 
So we'll send over a timestamp and we see that that worked, right? So we see here, our timestamp came over just as expected. And then we see here that we have, well, a small handful of aircraft that just rolled in. So that's good. Again, we send a request, we get back a stream of values and that's working exactly as expected because things never go wrong in live demos. <laughs> oh well. <laughs> So we have covered a couple of the interaction models that are provided by RSocket. Let's go a little bit farther here. Uh, so we have fire and forget, which is very useful at times because not always do you want a value back. You just want to be able to send something and move on. So we're going to uh, create an endpoint called fire forget and well, we'll return a mono void. So effectively we're returning nothing. So fire and forget. And let's see, let's get a value of a mono of weather. Now we don't have any weather just yet. So let's go ahead and skip over and we'll take care of that first. So let's define our weather. So maybe thing one is responsible for tracking weather reports, right? This is very important in aviation because you want to know what you're getting into. If the winds are too high, if the visibility is too low, you can't fly, or at least you can't fly safely unless you fly by instruments. And even then you have certain weather conditions that you simply can't fly in, right? So, uh, so we're going to create a weather class and let's see. So actually I'm just going to make this an at value with Lombok, which means it handles all the visibility. So let's make this, um, let's see, an instant of when, right? And a string of uh, called observation. All right, and we'll do the same thing here. And we'll go ahead and, again, time is short. I love copy pasting, not, but <laughs> we'll use it. All right, we're receiving a weather mono. So we'll take our weather mono and we'll subscribe to that. And we take our weather and let's just print that out, right? So um, let's see, so this will be sun and and then we'll return a mono an empty mono an empty mono so nothing yeah so let's go ahead and run that and then I'll go ahead and create the test method over here and thing one and we'll kick that off and make sure that everything is working as expected so um, so let's see this is our fire and forget all right so Let's see, requester.route, and we'll call, we're going to our fire forget message mapping, and the data we want to provide is what? Well, we'll create a new weather instance, and we'll use instant.now for our timestamp, and then we want to have an observation. So, sky's clear, visibility, 15 statute miles. That should be fine. And then in this case, we need to send it. And once again, we have to subscribe in order to, to get that to send, right? Because that's how you uh, establish that connection with the publisher and activate it, if you will. Okay, so um, yeah, should work. Let's go ahead and try that. And there we have it. Okay, so exactly what we expected to happen. We sent over a skies clear weather report and there we go. So everything is working as expected with fire and forget as well. So far, so good. We've covered three of the interaction models for our socket. Let's go ahead and cover the last one because that gets pretty exciting, right? And this is the bi-directional channel. That's exactly what it sounds like, right? So you can exchange information over that same connection, that same channel. So we're going to expect to send back a flux of aircraft or send over a flux of aircraft. We'll call this cleverly enough channel. And we're going to be receiving a flux of weather reports, a flux of observations here. So we'll call this WX flux. And here we go. So we'll take, uh, let's do a return WX flux and we'll, well, let's do on subscribe so we can see what happens here. So I'm going to when the initial subscription is entered into, if you will, what I'm going to do is take that sub and we'll just print out here, subscribed, subscribed to weather, weather. Very exciting, right? Three exclamation points. <laughs> and then on do on next, right? So we'll take each weather value and then I will print out that weather value. So let's grab, uh, let's grab some clouds eh, into everyone's life. A few clouds must fly and then we'll switch that so we take 
our flux coming in of weather and we switch that over and we map that to a flux, an outgoing flux of uh, aircraft. So I'm going to uh, take the weather observation and then I'm going to do a client.get and we'll retrieve those values. We'll convert the body to a flux of aircraft. And there we have it. And I do want to actually uh, add in a little bit of, because this will create just a an exchange that goes on and on and on until we break it forcibly. So what I want to do in this case is just add a way to handle that so it's a little more graceful. So on error dropped when the connection is dropped coming in. So we get an error that comes in. I'm just going to uh, print that out. Connection closed. And then we'll add that to the message. So just makes it a little nicer than seeing that stack trace that will inevitably result if I just close things out unceremoniously from the other end. So speaking of the other end, let's go ahead and create the test method here. So post construct, private void, and this will be our channel, right? So channel, channel spelling is a thing. Yeah, so requester.route, and we're going to uh, point this to our channel route and data. So we need data. So I'm going to just going to have some fun here. So I'm going to create a var and we'll call this. Sure. So this will be our weather list. So we'll create a list of weather observations. And in this case, well, we'll call this obs list because these are truly our observations. So a uh, list of, so let's say we have um, scattered at, at zero, zero, so 8,000 feet. Uh, visibility is 12 statute miles. That's that's one observation. So maybe we have few at 10,000 feet and visibility of, oh, let's say 15 statute miles. Let's go crazy. And then let's say we have overcast at uh, 030, so 3,000 feet and visibility is five miles, five statute miles. That's, that's cool. And then uh, let's say we have a uh, a little bit of randomness. I always like to insert some randomness into things. It keeps things light. So let's do that. So our data in this case will be here. We're going to create a flux with a certain interval and we're going to create just a pulse every one second. So we'll take that pulse and we'll map that. Well, if I can type map. So here we go. There, dot map, and we'll map that pulse, that long value that comes out, uh, to a new weather. And we'll use instant dot now for our timestamp. And then our observation will get random next int, and we'll bound that based on the number of observations that we have. So now we have our data. And then let's uh, retrieve a flux, in this case of aircraft. And then let's subscribe to that. So our subscribe. We're getting an aircraft once again, and let's see. So let's grab an airplane, airplane, and they're coming in. So we'll do that. Let's, uh, let's try that again and paste that in and plus AC. And there we have it. Okay. That's not bad. doesn't look bad. Let's run it and see what happens. Not sure why it inserted that extra import, but there, it seems happier now. Oh, it seems unhappy now. Oh, we might want to have a message mapping here for channel. That might, uh, that might help that considerably. So let's go ahead and start that. And start this. And there we have, we're, have it. We're subscribed to weather. We see that the aircraft are coming in to thing one. We see that the weather is coming into thing two and everything looks happy. Now, I do want to show you a couple of more things. I hope there is time. Uh, if not, then well, know that I had more to show you and I want to share so badly, but you know, we'll do what we can, right? So what I'm going to do in this case is just to go ahead and create another component and I'm going to enable scheduling here. And let's see, we'll make this pretty quickly. So this will be our fire and forget component because I think it's important to, to share that what I'm showing you again is just kind of the tip of the iceberg. So I'm going to schedule a method to happen at a fixed rate of one for every, once every three seconds. And then I'm just gonna grab my fire and forget method here, right? Let's bring that down. 
And, oh, I need to inject my RSocket requester, which we, again, have at our disposal. We've created the bean, so let's go ahead and run this. And this is kind of nice because we've established a connection, and that connection can be used across any number of, of methods and requests that may be going across that pipeline because, again, it is, it is a, an established connection between the applications. So we have here, we've got a, a weather value, a fire and forget weather value that's coming in every three seconds. We have weather values that are coming in every second here, and we're retrieving or receiving, I should say, uh, a, a number of aircraft each time uh, that we're sending a weather report from our thing to application or thing to service. Now I can go much further. Further uh, now here in this case, I'm going to go ahead and change the change the underlying transport to WebSocket. We've been using TCP, so let me go ahead and stop thing one, restart thing two. It's very easily done. We go back to thing one, and instead of establishing a TCP connection from builder, we just change this to WebSocket. I can just do localhost. 9091. Uh, let's do it right. HTTP. Yeah, that works just fine as long as I don't typo. And then, of course, I actually do need to make this into a URI, right? And voila, WebSocket will be our underlying transport. And everything works just the same equally well. So, with that, let's go back to our slides and finish up which is very simply done. If you want to know more, if you want to hear as things develop, please do follow me on Twitter, MK Heck. It's the cool spot to be, right? Twitter. Uh, so check me out there and uh, follow me and I happily share anything of interest, specifically about Spring Boot, RSocket, and just flying anything. Just fun stuff. Check out the Spring Boot book URL, the Spring Boot book Twitter account, and the code that you saw here and so much more is out under my RSocket repo on GitHub. Check it out. Star it, watch it, and stay in touch. Thanks so much for coming to DevNexus. Carry on. <laughs> <laughs>